seven years ago, I was unemployed, sitting in my bedroom, trying to understand how I could get Dreamweaver to help me make a website for a friend. Soon I had to learn about HTML, CSS, and web design. As time passed and I began to think that I knew how things worked, I wrote about semantic HTML, and I went so far as to remove all of the HTML classes from my blog. I learned how to use CSS pseudo elements so that I could style pages while keeping my markup sparse. And when I wrote about uh, that work, it was shared by people like Chris Coyer from CSS Tricks and gave me visibility amongst professional developers, such as yourselves. But once I started working on Teams, and I had to live with the consequences of that approach to front-end development, I saw how difficult it was to understand our code and how much time it took to make changes that weren't buggy and how the complexity that it introduced and created and the so-called expertise that it required limited the number of people who could work on the UI code. <clears throat> I remember feeling anxious about the environment that I'd helped to create for the team that I was working on, anxious about the things that I championed on my blog and concerned with the narrow-minded thinking that I'd slipped into and that is often rewarded by the designer and engineering community. I still get a little bit anxious when I think about how the decisions I make might negatively impact the lives of the people that I work with, or the people who read the stuff that I write about, or the people who use my open source projects. And the problems that we were struggling with on the teams that I was working on were not knowing what components had already been made, not knowing what CSS was safe to remove, not knowing what CSS was necessary to correctly render a page, having CSS break when we made changes and unrelated parts of the website were altered, and the UI breaking when segments of it were moved around into different parts of the application. And the cause of most of those problems were an unknown or incomprehensible series of CSS interdependencies, no local CSS scope, and no isolation of responsibility, and no ownership over styling Sub, uh, parts of the subtree of the DOM. So small changes could have large effects, making it hard, if not impossible, to know what the immediate consequences of your work would be. And it became increasingly complicated. And as the subparts of the UI became increasingly entangled, then it meant that our apps could no longer re render in predictable ways. And the more people were working in an environment like this, the more those problems manifested. So it left me questioning the work I'd done as a so-called CSS specialist in the companies that I was working at and in the teams I was part of and in the communities that I've been involved with. And I think we've often overdosed on CSS-focused solutions and the creation of complicated systems that we expect other engineers who don't specialize in CSS to take the time to understand. So you might wonder what it's like working at a company like Twitter, a place that created like Bootstrap and where on the desktop version of Twitter.com, you may have noticed we've started rolling out a BEM-like approach to CSS called Suit CSS. Well, the CSS that we work on at scale is still a major problem. We still have people stepping on each other's toes and weak agreements on how to operate and difficulty communicating with each other about what we're working on. And fundamentally, I think there are problems beyond the scope of solutions that CSS specialists can come up with. So, I mean, at least what Suit CSS accepts and expects is that you can't build applications or even a UI component using only CSS. So now at Twitter, we're trying to move away from these esoteric CSS-focused solutions designed by and for CSS specialists because my experiences have left me thinking that so-called scalable CSS fails to solve some of the foundational problems and difficulties that we have doing web development in Teams including teams of great engineers. So at Twitter, we're aiming to make substantial improvements to our UI development and our web products by taking a more holistic view of our problems and trying to come up with solutions that address all of those problems at once, and building solutions that place people and teams at their center. So it's not to say that this time we've got it right, but this time we're doing things differently and we know why we're doing them differently. So our approach is to look at how we scale the entire UI at once and in a way that's designed for adaptability and the requirement of always changing the UI and dealing with uh, unexpected demands of the business and changes that we have to make as our users change the way that they use Twitter. So we're not looking to be perfect, just to be adaptable. And we need to be able to work in multiple teams because we have lots of independent teams working on separate features at Twitter. We want to connect designers and engineers more closely as partners and to build a tool chain and architecture 
that is more empathetic to the needs of designers and engineers. So the work that we're doing is starting to see the UI module, the web component, as the primary unit of scale, the foundational building block of our applications. So these are some of the building blocks of a clock radio. So imagine if when you took this radio apart, instead of seeing what you see here, you've got raw materials like steel and aluminium and plastic and paper and silicon. And someone tried to explain to you how a radio works in terms of how you fuse bits of metal together and how the silicon conducts electricity. That would be really complicated because you can't use these high-level terms or these high-level components to describe it in terms of a circuit board and resistors and LEDs and transistors. And so the ex expertise required to understand how a radio would work if you couldn't use these higher level building blocks and the machinery used to create it would be exceptionally complicated and require extremely specialized knowledge. So instead, if we take this example and we think about segmentation of the UI along these functional boundaries and use these higher order functional building blocks that we can describe the application from, then each component can be used to define its own scope and its own use. Likewise, with our UI, We'd prefer to package all the technologies needed into interactive components and to be able to refer to them by name. So that way when we talk to each other, we can use this higher level domain specific language that we share in common and suddenly designers and engineers can have more common ground to talk about things on. But when the designers talk amongst themselves and when they talk to us and when we talk amongst ourselves as engineers, the same words are used, the same descriptions are used to describe the options about how these components work. So a UI component is a cohesive functional building block of the application. I'm gonna provide a brief overview of the fundamentals of UI components as we're thinking about them and the stuff that we're doing at Twitter. And if you know anything about web components from the W3C perspective, then these will look familiar to you. So this is an annotated uh, screen of our Android app, but I'm gonna pretend that it's a web app and walk through a simple example of a piece of the UI to highlight the key technical concepts and the features of using UI components as building blocks on the web. So each of these labeled components defines a private subtree. So you can think of them as tree fragments. So on the left here you have the tweet and its tree fragment includes a photo and an attribution component. And the photo component has this private tree that you can see. And part of that tree is defining an insertion point, which is an area of its tree that will accept arbitrary HTML that it will render in place. And when you actually render this tweet, and the tweet has passed in this attribution component into the photo, this is the rendered composite tree that you get. So we can build these complex trees while maintaining the separation of concerns and the separation of responsibilities between these private trees. So if we look at the photo in more detail, you'll see that each component defines its own API. And this is some kind of pseudo code that's like a mixture of React and uh, Google's Clojure soy templates. And so our template here defines a series of parameters and their types most of the time. So you would say that the size is a string, source is a string, content is HTML. And for a given input, the rendered HTML is always the same. So we kind of borrow this functional uh, model from functional programming, where for a given input, the same output comes out from the function. And this helps to simplify UI development because you can tightly define the tree needed by this component without having to know about the rest of the app and without the rest of the app having to know anything about the subtree that this uh, component is building. And so this is how we would use a component using that API. So the photo defined a source, size, and content. The content is just the direct children of the photo element. And then the source and size are the attributes that we're using. And so the, the home page here is requiring the necessary components and building up a tree using this abstraction. So this kind of configuration greatly simplifies reuse because it defines and limits the possibilities like a multiple choice. It's much easier to pass multiple choice exams because there are only four options and you've got 25% chance, even if you're just guessing to get it right. And so in terms of like maintaining a component, this also means that as long as you define a tight API and you expose that for others to use, that you can continue to modify the internals, the way that it works, the accessibility of your component without altering that API. And those changes will just propagate throughout the system and update throughout the entire app. The only time you should need to touch other components is when you modify the API in a breaking way and you need to go and change the call sites for that component in other parts of the application. So this is quite similar to web components and to how the shadow DOM works. So even now, if you look at um, an input element in Chrome and you turn on shadow DOM, you can see as I've 
got in the screenshot here, the document fragment, the private tree that the browser vendors are using to implement the input um, once you've configured it with the relevant type and value. And in that tree, they can provide all the accessibility help as they want and style it as they need without you as the consuming developer having to know anything about it. And so when we use this component model, the CSS returns to a slightly simpler role where instead we just focus on styling this private subtree. And this is what suit CSS and related tools and methodologies are all designed for. So the styles are scoped to the component's private subtree, this private HTML fragment, and the DOM interaction from the JavaScript is also limited to this tree. And this means that we can now predict the rendering and the behavior of our widget. And wherever we place it into the app, we know that it's going to behave and look the same way. This means we've defined and isolated the responsibilities of this tree. And in order to protect the trees in, the, in these composed models, uh, we use tooling. And so there's this plugin that I wrote called post TSS BEM linter. And when you apply the, this use strict option on the end, it will actually throw a build error when you try and style a subcomponent, a component that doesn't belong in the component that you're authoring. So that way you can try and control the leaking of styles throughout the tree and make sure that the attribution component always renders the same wherever it is in, the, in your application. So one more thing we need to do is to create a dependency graph uh, that includes CSS and our other assets so that we can have these like, predictable trees so we know when we talk about the home page that the assets that we have on the home page are exactly the ones that we need. And one way to do this is to leverage the existing module system and the advanced build tools that we have for JavaScript. So we're using a great tool at Twitter called Webpack, and Webpack is, uh, has loaders a bit like AMD does. And here, when I'm just requiring the CSS-only dependencies, it's intelligent enough to recognize that, and you can specify options to extract that CSS into bundles. Um, and this means that the intelligent bundle splitting that you might use for your JavaScript, where you only load the JavaScript that you need for the home page on the home page, and you have a common JavaScript bundle for all of the other pages on your website, the same pattern can be used for CSS. And we can like, piggyback on that uh, dependency graph, and Webpack will build a parallel CSS dependency graph and allow you to treat it much in the same way as you would your JavaScript. So to help engineers and designers uh, think about this and the build tools that we need to implement this kind of system, we look to make the file system and the directories on the file system consistent with the architectural design. Instead, we cut the whole UI up into these siblings, and each one of them is placed in its own directory. And so a flat tree mirroring the global scope here ensures that no two modules can occupy the same name. And this is really important for the tooling that we have to try and make sure that when you define a photo, there isn't another component somewhere else also called photo, which is attempting to style a different private tree. So if we look at the photo itself, then inside is the JavaScript and the CSS. If you're using a server-side language like we do at Twitter, then we also place the Scala view in this. Um, and all of the assets, documentation, and tests that are needed by this component can be found in one place. And this gives us a lot of predictability as well for our components because any component that you go into will have the same directory structure, really similar patterns. And we want to build up this kind of common expectation for developers. And so each of our modules as well, when you cut them up like this, can have defined owners. So we might use build tools to, uh, or commit tools to notify those people automatically when someone makes a change to this module that isn't an owner. And it also makes it easier for teams to communicate between each other because if I need to alter the photo, I make sure that I find out who the photo owners are and I go and talk to them and tell them, we need to add some new features to your photo. So every single component has this common structure and can feel part of like a common pattern in the, in the application. So related to this and this idea of like shared ownership or of a, a trail of owners so we know who works on multiple parts of the UI when you have not just one big team but multiple big teams building into an application is the idea that you have greater empathy for people that you identify as being part of us rather than them or the other. And by making a common series of patterns in the UI, making it so that all the uh, components that we're building have a similar look and feel no matter who's made them, we want to try and help reduce that feeling of uh, conflict between teams and rather seeing us all working in a similar environment, doing, making similar decisions and having similar constraints on the decisions that we can make. And so the consistency in the code and clear ways to do things helps to increase this empathy as well as make automation easier because now we can have generalized patterns such as the entry file is an index.js file, the test file is of the pattern unit.spec.js and so on. So now the build tools can make these assumptions and we can generate um, like the build assets and our test results in a way that is like predictable. 
And this automation provides support enforcing the model that the, of the application architecture itself and teaching new people when they come into the teams and join like Twitter and work on new projects um, about how it is that we should operate, throw errors when they're doing things that we don't want them to be doing, uh, and generally enhancing expertise by lowering the barrier to entry and keeping CSS in particular simple within the UI architecture rather than requiring specialist knowledge or knowledge of the rest of the application and how your changes might inadvertently break it. So that consistently, consistency helps to build habits, and good habits are part of being productive. And being productive is extremely important uh, in general. So we want to have people come in and develop patterns based on the familiarity of every part of the UI. That means they can rely on those habits that they internalize and start thinking just about solving the particular problem that they have at a given point in time. And this process of simplifying the experience and of simplifying the way that people work and pushing a lot of things out of someone's concern when they're working on the application is known as black boxing in sociology. So an example would be turning a light on. When you turn a light on, it just works. You don't really know why. You wouldn't know all of the details about the entire infrastructure that allows you to press a light switch and the light to come on. And the French philosopher Bruno Latour described black boxing as the way technical and scientific work is made invisible by its own success. When a machine runs efficiently, when a matter of fact is settled, one need only focus on its inputs and outputs and not on its internal complexity. Thus, paradoxically, the more science and technology succeed, the more opaque and obscure they become. So good components empower designers and engineers by letting them think about just the inputs and the outputs and not their internal complexity. And this is how we're looking to scale our UI and to think about CSS within this model of design and development at Twitter. Thank you.